Hello, and welcome to today's webinar, Risk-Free Reservoir Management, How Resman Makes the Difference. Thank you for taking time out and being here today. I am Asel, the Marketing Manager here in Resman, and today, together with me, I have Ed, our technology expert from uh, Dubai in Middle East, and Colin, our regional sales manager for UK and Africa, based in Aberdeen. Before we start, let me explain how you can talk to us during the webinar. We will be running a live Q&A at the end of the session, so we have enabled our Ask a Question feature. It is on the right-hand hand side of your screen, so if you have any questions, just put them in there. And if you miss anything, don't worry, we will be sending around the on-demand recording when it is available. Now we can begin. And um, I would like to welcome Colin and lead us through the topic of challenges in oil and gas industry and the solution we may offer. So Colin, the floor is yours. Thank you, Asim. Hi, everyone. I will start with some of the challenges of reservoir monitoring how trace data will help you understand your reservoir performance and how this data can be used to improve production. I will cover what trace data looks like, what tracers do, how we deploy traces into your well and the tracer applications. So what are the challenges? Production monitoring can be difficult and expensive for many reasons. Three of the issues include wellhead access, whether it's deep water or subsea well, or it could just be geography, uh, being a jungle or swamp or desert. The second issue is reservoir access. Uh, these wells would have added risk and cost for downhole monitoring applications. So reaching the target depth on wireline or cold tubing for logging may not be achieved in the case of horizontal wells, multilaterals, or assisted wells with ESP or oil pumps. And then the third issue is the data itself. When I have the data, will it still be of value? And can I improve my production? In the case of water breakthrough, we want to know where the water is coming from and how we can control it. Often this will be defined by the type of well, whether it's subsea or platform, and the type of completion hardware that's in the well, uh, such as uh, flow control valves. And then there's the economics of intervention versus production value. So how do we improve our reservoir management? We have a reservoir model and surface production data that will confirm the production profile of the well, the expected well life and the overall field production. Running chemical traces to follow the production fluid from your completions and reservoirs to surface will improve the reservoir description and provide information to help make informed decisions to improve production for the field. Our aim today is to illustrate the cost benefit of running resin traces in your reservoir. And these include optimizing the well length and well spacing to increase your production. Traces are a proven alternative to the more expensive or more risky monitoring techniques, such as PLTs, DTS, and 4D seismic. Water traces will optimize your water treatment and also your new installation plan as well. And finally, confirming any enhanced oil recovery plans before full field implementation. What should be emphasized here is the earlier traces are used in any field development, the greater benefit to reservoir production. Sometimes the benefits of the value of information may not be realized on the current well, if intervention is not possible, but will benefit the next well, future wells, and the overall field development. So typically, everyone wants to know, um, did my well clean up? Is my tow producing? Where in my production well is the water breakthrough coming from? When did my reservoir performance change? Why did it change? What injection well supports where in the reservoir? Which injection sweep do I have? And is the structural model supported? And then hopefully we can optimize our reservoir management strategy. So this is where um, tracers will tell you, uh, this is where tracers will add value by potentially answering all of these questions and some surprises along the way too. 
Traces will tell you which fluid is flowing from where, which zone or reservoir layer in the well is producing oil, or even if there's no flow. Traces will quantify how effective each injection well is on the water flood and provide answers on how to improve recovery. So how is a tracer data presented? Um, here we're looking at um, a plot of water traces from a horizontal subsea well. The well has four monitoring locations within the completion with four unique water traces. There's a multi-phase flow meter on the wellhead for the flow rate and water cut. And uh, as you see in the graph here, the water cut is uh, this dotted grey line. So from the left, each of the traces are monitored regularly and we have uh, data analysis to uh, measure the amount of tracer that we find at every sample. So from the left here, the graph shows the background tracer response from each monitoring location and it's flat. And then after the 10th of August, we see a significant increase in the tracer response from the heel. And then uh, four weeks later, we see from zone two in green here, another increase in tracer response. This also correlates to an increase in the uh, multiphase meter water cut gradient for these two locations uh, in August and also in September. So this is a clear example where tracers provide an independent correlation of both water influx events, so that if the multiphase meter is out of calibration or it fails, then water tracers will confirm water entry and identify the location of that water entry. This data will also provide clear information for any proposed water shutoff plan and tell you which zone to target. So this graph clearly shows that taking regular weekly samples by the production engineer is essential to track or capture a water breakthrough event. If there are no samples, there's no analysis and there's no added value. So what are chemical tracers? Uh, these are molecules. Our tracer molecules are developed in-house. So the molecule design will want to go to the target fluid, whether it be oil or water, or water or gas. Our unique traces are detectable in low concentrations. They are environmentally approved and stable across a wide temperature range. We identify our traces as either uh, inflow traces or pumpable traces. The inflow traces are embedded in polymer rods during the manufacturing process. So we will have polymer rods to target water and polymer rods to target oil. When the polymer rods are in contact with the target fluid or wetted by the fluid, the traces are released at a known rate for the temperature range. This means we're able to confirm how long we can detect traces exposed to the target fluid. And so far we have been able to uh, detect traces, uh, oil traces, up to 10 years after they've been wetted by oil and up to seven years for water. We have uh, laboratory records and field data examples to prove our tracer longevity and detection over time. The second tracer is a pumpable tracers and these traces are mixed or dissolved in water and pumped into the injector well, mainly water injectors or gas storage wells. In the case of water tracers, these pumpable tracers stay with the water fluid and travel through the, the reservoir, ideally to the production well, and they're used to confirm interwell reservoir connections. Uh, later on, Ed will illustrate uh, two case studies that show just how effective pumpable tracers can be. So how do we deploy tracers in the well? Our inflow tracers uh, are normally installed in the lower completion and the pumpable tracers are injected into the reservoir. So first of all, inflow tracers. In this first picture, we see a sand screen and here we insert the oil and water tracer rods into the drainage layer between the sand screen material and the base pipe. And this will happen at the screen manufacturer's location. 
installing water and oil rods in the same zone helps to confirm the flow response. So for example, if you have a water breakthrough in this zone, then there would be a reduced oil trace response from the same zone. Wells with casing and liner will have tracer wrapped around the liner and secured in sleeve. The liner is run as normal into the well, cemented, and the tracer sleeve is positioned in a zone of interest. Then the, uh, the perforating guns will perforate the well, perforate the uh, screen, and create the flow path for the production fluid and the chasers to come to surface. Our pumpable chasers are mixed and suspended in fluid. Uh, in this case, uh, this first picture, are put on a truck or sailed to the well, and then injected into the flow line. It's a very straightforward process. So as you see here in the desert, on the back of the truck, the IBCs are filled with uh, tracers and there's water for flushing out lines, injection pumps and generators uh, so that the operation can be performed uh, over a few wells uh, in the same day. The volumes of fluid or tra of tracers uh, to inject is reflected by the, the size of the reservoir and where sampling will take place. So if it's a relatively small uh, reservoir volume, then the, uh, the, the tracer volumes to be pumped will be less. So what are, what are the applications for, for tracers? For inflow tracers, we can provide a quantitative zonal inf in inflow contribution or a productivity assessment within a well, and Ed will explain soon how this is calculated. We can confirm your well has cleaned up before the rig has moved off location, prior to suspension, or when the well is turned on for production. We also identify when you have a water breakthrough in the well. In some, case, in some cases, performing a multi-rate test will provide zonal inflow changes to different drawdown scenarios, and by taking regular tracer samples, provide a continuous monitoring record for your well. This will provide qualitative trends and well events. Sampling for tracers can be at the wellhead, on the rig, during a well test, on a production platform, or commingled on the flow line of a riser. And we've sampled wells that are uh, 20 kilometers away from the subsea wellhead. So where there's fluid transport, we will be able to detect the tracers. It's important to note that the higher the flow rate at the sampling location, the more tracing material is required to be run with the well completion. And this is to offset the dilution effect of tracers at the sampling location. So the most important thing for uh, permanent inflow tracers is to sample and sample regularly. Analysis is only required on those samples that will provide value. Our pumpable tracer applications are as follows. And the most important or the most often used one is the interwell tracer test. And this is to identify and quantify physical interwell connections. Verifying fracking operations with on site results will confirm the fracking process is optimized. And again, Ed will uh, present a case study on this application as well. For EOR applications, to determine the near well residual oil saturation, we use our single well chemical tracer test, which is essential to confirm an EUR treatment solution is going to work. We also have partitioning tracers to determine the remaining oil. Uh, and this can be between an injector and a producer to optimize or to, to enhance the recovery from the well. And finally, working with industry, we now offer data integration into your data systems. Hopefully this introduction to tracers has explained the value that resident tracers offer to our industry, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Colin. Now we have time to look into some case studies, but before that, uh, I would like to make a brief announcement to those of you who joined uh, uh, 10 minutes after we started, 
that we will be sending around the on-demand recording when it is available, so to make sure that you don't miss anything. So if you are interested in receiving the presentation, let us know. And also please use the question area on the right side of your screen to, to make sure that you bring us all the questions that you would like our experts to answer. So having that said, I would like to welcome Ed on board. Ed? Thank you, Ozell, for the introduction. Um, and thank you, Colin. So Colin's covered um, yeah, the inter introduction of different uh, type of traces that can be applied um, in, in your reservoirs. And what I'm going to talk about is the application, of course, uh, through uh, some different case studies. So I'm going to start off with um, some case studies related to the permanent inflow traces that are installed in the completion while it's run in whole. So the first case study is about continuous monitoring. Um, but before I go there, um, typically um, we have global production data such as what you see on the screen. We have uh, two months of uh, very low water production or flat water cut, uh, stable bottom hole pressure, temperature and oil production. And then two months later, you actually see a breakthrough, of course, here where the water cut gradually increases, the oil production de declines gradually, and also the gas is also getting a bit noisy. And at the same time, the bond hole temperature is increasing as well. Now, if you did not have traces, you would not know which zone is producing water, of course. You just know that well is producing water. But if trace inflow traces are installed in your completion, like we have in this case, um, we can identify the offending zone or zones. So what you see in um, these, this colored map, you could say, is um, a plot of mass flow. And mass flow is the tracer concentration multiplied by the water production rate. Um, and that's the, the blue and red um, colored plot. And the one below is the oil mass flow or flux, which is the oil concentration multiplied by the oil rate. And in this particular well, we have six zones. You see labeled one to six. And we have water traces in zones one, three, and four and stored. In zones two, five, and six, there are no water traces at all. But when it comes to oil, the operator had installed uh, oil traces um, in all zones from zones one through to six. Now, the, when I'm in continuous sampling, what's happening here is that the operator is, in this case, uh, collecting samples every two weeks. And then we can um, create this um, mass flow uh, map that you see. And you see that when you move to this point, uh, when water breaks through, it indicates immediately, and you can see visually that this is where the water breakthrough has occurred in zone one. And you can also correlate this with the uh, oil mass flow or flux, is that it's green, light green, but then it basically deviates to almost zero. So as you see in the legend here, so the, the white color means there's, there's little or no um, tracer being detected here because um, the water is basically dominating the flow, and, and hence we don't detect um, any oil mass flux producing back. So I'll go to this. Um, zone two, we can actually um, see that we have very poor uh, mass flow from the zone from, from the beginning. And I know this well was cleaned up, and a few months later, uh, we, we are still not getting much contribution. So this could, this could indicate that there was a suboptimal cleanup of zone two. Now in zone three, uh, we can see that the um, oil mass flow is fluctuating a bit. So again, that gives you some, some indication um, that something a little bit strange is, is happening um, in zone three from all perspective. Okay, so um, yeah, this is a, a, a typical service that we provide uh, operators who 
regularly take samples uh, while the world is just on steady state production and we can plot these trends uh, for each zone to understand uh, how the well is performing over time. Now the next example is about um, transient um, campaign and before I go there we need to create transient to quantify flow from each zone and there's a, a model that we call the flush out model uh, which is what we use to quantify flow. Uh, and in order to quantify flow, we need a transient. And the best type of transient is a shut-in. <clears throat> so if we shut in the well temporarily, what will happen is that those traces located in uh, this, at their specific depths will build up a concentration, pill or slug, around the vicinity of that um, screen or that carrier where they've been stored at different depths. And when you turn on the well, of course, that trace of slug or that pill will, will be transported by the flow when the well is started. And a typical response that you see um, is, uh, is what you see on the screen here with uh, three responses. It peaks and then it declines rapidly towards um, steady state. So how do we apply this model? We basically apply, we, we can qualitatively actually see that what I've plotted here. Think of the y-axis as concentration versus time. You can see the, the decline or the decay from the peak to steady state is much more rapid compared to the blue zone, which is a lower peak and that it reaches steady state. Uh, it takes longer to reach steady states and therefore the decay constant is smaller relative to the red. So if you have a, a large decay constant, you, it means you have high inflow. And if you have a, a small decay constant, you have low inflow, but it's relative to each other uh, in the well. And we fit this model um, to the trace responses. Um, and we are then able to estimate how much comes from each compartment or, or each zone. And the next slide will uh, show you this um, as a case study. So in, in this particular case study, we're dealing with a, a marginal field development um, and it's subsea. Uh, it's a dual lateral ICD tied back to, uh, to the platform uh, th through 19 kilometers. And the example I'm going to show you is uh, a restart of this well. It will shut in. And then 40 days, and, th and then, well, 40 days after on production, we, we restart the well. And uh, what you can see in the, in the lateral is that we're monitoring 10 zones. So we actually have 20 unique traces in this well, because at each location, we have a unique pair of oil and water traces. And you see on the right is the uh, tracer rod or the polymers that are stored in the sand screen that is part of the ICD joint as well. So when we start up the well, um, this is what we, what, rece what we received after the analysis in the lab. So first of all, I can just say that every um, tracer was detected because we see a nice peak and decline to steady state. Now, the, the, uh, the traces um, in that flow area uh, in A just sort of represents the residual traces that may have been uh, lying around in the upper completion and we detect them early when the well starts. But the, the, the traces that actually were created while the well is shut in and left uh, from, its, from its depth uh, that it was um, installed comes, comes up now uh, to peak and decay to steady state levels. So B is the most important part of the curve that we need to, uh, to perform quantification to match a flush out model to this period. C is basically the steady state um, uh, concentrations that you see there. So if you look at the top right hand corner, uh, we've separated the each individual curve uh, in, in, in one plot. 
uh, labeled from OS1, which means the oil tracer one to oil tracer 10. And you see that the, the red dots are the, the measured um, data, tracer data, and the dotted lines is our, our model match using the flush out. Now, after matching, we were able to see that OS9, which is located in the lateral itself, uh, is the best as a contributor to production relative to all the other compartments. And what I've done is now I've normalized that to one. So, so how do we, we understand this? So let's say we look at the toe uh, tracer one. This is 0.45. So we're, this is producing 0.45 or 45% uh, relative to compartment OS9. And for OS7 in the toe, for example, it's producing 41% of OS9. So it's just a quick way to understand um, the, 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 the relative performance of each compartment that we're monitoring. Now, if I uh, convert this to percentages, uh, first of all, we can see that the lateral is contributing about 57% and the main bore 43%. And then we have the individual relative contribution in percentage terms uh, of each compartment. So clearly we can see about 33% of contribution for this entire lateral comes from compartment nine. And the least performing relative to other compartments is compartment number six, one about 2% contribution only. So what have we learned from just this restart? First of all, all traces are detected. So that just means every zone is producing. And also the, the two toe areas are also producing and, and verified, which was actually very important for this operator to know as well. Um, the cleanup was successful because, yeah, we've detected all the oil traces uh, robustly. Uh, we're able to quantify without intervention. We're able to provide total contribution per lateral and identified zone nine as the highest contributor relative to its peers or other compartments. And the results compared well with their simulation models. This was, uh, a, this was one of the first wells they drilled in, in the field and with limited information. And it also confirmed their, their key assumption of their reservoir model as well with the data that they received. So, okay, I've just covered uh, two case studies on inflow. So now I'm gonna move to pumpable tracer uh, case studies. So before I, I go into the case studies, um, I just want to yeah, spend a slide about the benefits of, of interwell tracings. Um, I think we all know that if you, if you pump traces in, in injectors, uh, you want to detect them in the producer. And when you do, you understand which producers are connected to, to which injectors. And hence, we'll understand the reservoir connectivity in the, in the, in the reservoir. Uh, however, we may have some geological features. You may have a fault, but you don't know if that fault is sealing or non-sealing. And if it's sealing, we shouldn't see, you shouldn't detect the tracer. Uh, at all, uh, but if it isn't, then yeah, the tracer would be able to migrate through a non-sealing fault and be able to detect um, tracers in a in a nearby fault block. Um, also, yeah, tracers are useful, to, especially in carbonate reservoirs, to to uh, identify conductive uh, fracture corridors, which are very common in the Middle East. The second benefit is about quantifying the magnitude of water breakthrough. So what I mean is that, for example, if we were to inject pump 100 kilograms in I2, and we recover five kilograms in P2, and we recover 95 kilograms in P3, then obviously the, the more important connection in the reservoir is I2 to P3. And we can rank the importance of this, you know, based on, on what I've just um, explained. So we know the fraction of tracer being recovered compared to what's been injected. The third benefit, of course, is about the time of water breakthrough. Um, and, and also, if we know the injection rates and the time of water breakthrough, we can calculate the swept volume and, and know how large a volume we're actually sweeping between the, in, in, the injected well and where they're being produced. 
But here's a case study, number three, um, about identifying unswept oil by com combining tracer data. So with this operator, they had this um, assumption that there was connectivity in this fluvial environment where there are channel sands between um, injector B and producer AB. So you can actually see that there's um, this sort of light colored area is a channel sand and there wasn't much of a, any sort of connectivity, at least at that time, they thought, between injector A and AB. So, but when they're doing their, their modeling and they're trying to perform the history match, this is, this is the observed concentration being detected, but they were, uh, but basically the simulator was, was basically flatlined and it, it didn't um, predict any uh, tracer. The simulated trace response based just basically didn't match. So the operator then decided to uh, inject tracer, inject the A, to verify if there's any connectivity, and there was. And and if you detect it, if you pump the inject the A and you receive and produce AB, then you verify this is the, the source of of your injected water. So the operator, of course, had to manipulate their model by basically widening the channel sand inside the model. And here, uh, of course, what happened was that they were able to match the tracer, the simulated trace response from the simulator compared to the observed trace response that you see in the points. So what does that mean? That actually meant that, of course, they had a misunderstanding of their reservoir and the model was incorrect. It got recalibrated based on the tracer input. And then you would, then they've identified that actually we have a quite a big area of unswept oil between injector A, uh, injector B to producer AB. Okay. Now the next case study um, is sort of putting all the, the benefits of, of interwell tracer together. Um, here we have, we're in a carbonate reservoir. We have an injector where we inject tracer. We have producer B and producer PA. So you see that, um, I'll, I'll go through the, what this legend is about. So the time of breakthrough uh, to PB is about 54 days, which is quite a, a rapid breakthrough. Um, the mass recovered, although small, is 0.14% of what was, inje was injected. And the volume swept is 680 meter cubed, which is not, not quite that large, considering that I know that the distance between these two wells is about a kilometer. If you would divide that by a kilometer, we would get 0.68 uh, meter cubed of swept volume, which is actually you know, less than a meter cubed. So that's very, very small. So what that indicates to you is that, you know, we're not sweeping very much. But we've identified a heterogeneity that there is some large fracture communication. There's some fracture communication between I1 and PB. So let's have a look at the results uh, over here. So the mass produced in PA is not that large, but it's 3.3%, it's but certainly much larger than PB. Um, and the swept volume is, is much larger. So this would mean that you're getting much more better sweep uh, volume from, in, from the injector to, to PA. And also the breakthrough time took much longer, even though it was much closer um, to, to the injector of, of 82 days. Um, yeah, and, and here we, we, we see the, um, the, the tracer responses, um, the breakthrough, to PB was early, it's much sharper, you can see, and declines to, to steady state. And the, the delayed uh, breakthrough is, is in PA is obvious too. A much broader uh, or wider signal because it's, it's, it's basically spending longer in the reservoir and sweeping more oil. So um, you, you, you may have seen, uh, you, you, you can read that uh, I have, mentioned something called Lorentz coefficient. Um, it's basically this number defines um, how much heterogeneity is in your reservoir. 
the higher the number, the more heterogeneity there is. And in this case, it's 0.46, which is quite a large number because it's a carbonate reservoir. And the number here is, is, is smaller. I don't have time to um, explain you know, how the, the Lawrence coefficient is defined, but um, we will explain that in a subsequent uh, webinar. But you just need to know that it's a measure of um, flow heterogeneity in your reservoir. Um, on the last case study is about uh, on-site analysis uh, of uh, monitoring a fracked well. So a bit of background about this, this case study. Um, it was performed in a, in a gas reservoir. Um, we have, um, they were fracking four zones and pumping the stimulation fluid from, from a vessel. And in each stage with the propent, we were adding uh, traces. We also had ready um, a lab temporary on the on on the drilling rig to analyze um, you know the, the traces as as they were sampled um, and this operator typically thought a cleanup was about seven days just a general rule of thumb um, they had before they started using traces pumpable traces in the well so if you look at this plot we got tracer recovery versus produced volume you can see that in the WT4, zone four and zone three, they do come back, uh, they do recover rapidly. So they, they're cleaning up quite quickly, of course. Um, zone two, you see that there's a bit of delay and also one, but zone two eventually starts um, producing, back producing tracer. And the toe definitely is struggling. And so after seven days, they realize that, you know, we, we don't know if we're going to, the toe's going to clean up. So they luckily had um, cold tubing on site and acid, and they stimulated the toe based on the information we provided. And what you see, of course, immediately after spotting acid, the recovery of tracer rapidly increased. And hence, uh, we, we verified that all zones are contributing uh, after fracking. And in fact, this took 10 days instead of the rule of thumb of seven days and we verified the cleanup of course as well um, so how do we combine interwell and uh, inflow traces you may ask let's, con let's consider this example where you're only pumping um, pumpable traces in an injector um, you, if you pump it and in this two zone uh, reservoir some traces can enter this zone one and some traces can enter zone two and we detect it because they both uh, broke, broke through. And the typical response would be like this double peak that you see. So a zone has broke through, another zone has broke through, but we don't know if it's zone one or zone two. So what if, you, what if we were to install permanent inflow traces? You would get the inflow traces coming back with returning with the pumpable tracer. So here you can see that uh, zone two is, uh, is responsible for the first peak and zone one is responsible for the second peak. Okay, so there's a simple example on how we can combine the, the, the two uh, analysis um, together. So um, to summarize on the technology, traces um, technology is, is, is proven for decades and it's been used for, for many different applications. And I personally don't see any technical reason not to inject or install permanent traces in, in any reservoir in the world. It's risk-free um, technology because it's operationally simple. You don't need um, highly trained or skilled people to do injections or perform sampling. Um, our traces, uh, are all unique they and therefore then they won't interfere uh, with each other in in any way and finally um you're getting conclusive inflow information and into a flow into um information you know understanding sweat pore volumes you know is your injection strategy working are you sweeping volumes you want to sweep optimizing injection production strategy after tracer data is received so there's a lot of value in just using tracer information alone to understand inflow and, and, 
and how it flows in the reservoir. And what I've covered uh, with Colin um, are examples related to permanent inflow monitoring, into a monitoring and pumpable inflow monitoring. So what would what will what we have time for now is um, Q and A. Yes, thank and you, I'll, Ed. Thank you. Uh, thank you for, for, for the presentation. It was four case studies we wanted to share with you today, and we hope you found them interesting. If so, we invite you to reach out, Ed, for more details or further further questions. And if you're curious to learn more about case studies in a specific region, please visit our website, 3wresman.no, and find the contact person for the region you are interested in, who will be happy to assist. So now, as I said, we have time to answer some of the questions. Thanks a lot for, to all of you who are bringing your questions in. We have a good control over the time, so it looks like we have enough uh, time to answer as much questions as possible. And let us start with uh, question number one, which is, uh, what is the limit for, uh, what is the limit for two-phase flow quantification? And I guess this question is to you, Colin. Thank you, Asil. Um, the, uh, the quantification of two-phase flow, uh, predominantly we require the, the predominant, predominant flow in order to calculate uh, inflow contribution. Uh, this is the more, the, more, uh, the less uh, concentration of a, a particular phase, then we are unable to know the actual wetting downhole of that particular material. So uh, we we will quantify when there's a, a predominant flow of oil, um, and then obviously any data when there's a, a, a mixed um, flow rate, then um, there's less uh, or more risk um, in quantifying those numbers. Okay, thank you, Colin. Uh, we hope that the, this answer was uh, good enough. If you have further questions to clarify the answer, please also write in the questions area. The second question is, can you retrofit existing wells with traces? Somebody asks. So, Ed, would you help me with this one? Sure. So, yeah, sure. Yeah, it, it is it is possible to to retrofit uh, with the uh, inflow traces, but it's actually very dependent on your completion type. And if you have, for example, a nipple where we can hang a a tracer carrier without without traces, then that's uh, one way of, of retrofitting inside um, inside a well bore that already exists for the completion. Right. Very good, thank you, Ed. Then we have another question about, it just says measuring residual oil. Maybe, Ed, you can elaborate on that. Yeah, sure. So, yeah, we, we, we didn't cover this as, as a case study, um, but we will, uh, in a future webinar, um, explain that in, in more detail. But yes, um, we have, a single well tracer test where we basically pump um, a let's say a passive tracer along with a, a partitioning tracer a, a, a reaction occurs uh, down hole over a certain period of time and the partitioning tracer will partition and then we we flow the well back and we look at the the arrival time difference between the partitioning tracer with the uh, passive tracer, and we can estimate the residual, residual oil saturation through a, a simple equation. Um, we can also do the same um, between wells as well, um, injecting and then and then detecting with producer. We would right. pump a right. standard tracer, uh, passive tracer, and also partitioning. Oh. The passive tracer will arrive earlier than a partitioning. In the meantime, the partitioning is traveling through the, the, um, the permeability in the well and partitioning to the oil that's, you know, that's remaining around the, um, the sand grains. And, they, and hence they get delayed. 
and once they uh, once we get the arrival time of both, we again use a quite a simple analytical equation to estimate the um, residual oil saturation between wells. So we can do it in well, in let's say around the near well bore, and also between wells as well. Right. Thank you, Ed. I hope we we have answered your question. There is a, one question, I guess, which is uh, asking to clarify some, some some definitions. So it says, could you explain what you mean with a partitioning tracer? So, yeah. 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 Please. Sure. Yeah. So so. A, partition, a, a partitioning tracer has an affinity to um, oil or water. Um, it, it just it, say it's attracted to it, and it picks up um, some of the the oil, the residual oil that's um, residing in the uh, around the the sand grain, um, and then it um, yeah, um, it basically has has an, has an attraction. To, to oil or water, and we design it to be attracted to um, to to the to the oil, um, and we can design it in the lab, um, and we we calculate the partitioning coefficient um, from the lab, so we know how much affinity that it, it has to to the oil. Um, yeah, so that's yeah basically the the quick answer. Um, um, to that question. Right, thank you, Ed. Another question is, could you please talk about life period of permanent traces? Is somebody asking? We we had that, that uh, in, in yeah. Colin's presentation, yeah. Please, Colin. So, for example, the uh, uh, we design our traces to release tracer over over a period of time. Um, so the, the tracer rods will, will deplete uh, over time. And what we need to do is to ensure that to, to be able to detect tracers, we have to have sufficient number of rods so that we can meet, uh, we can actually detect um, tracers back in the lab. So for now, in the UK, in the UK at least, um, the any tracers that we install in the wells now then we have tracer life for oil to be detected after 10 years, and uh, water tracers can be detected up to seven years. Now, not all wells are, are targeted for that, uh, will offer that particular lifespan. Uh, sometimes the, the temperature range is, uh, uh, affects the release of the tracer, so sometimes some wells are not going to have the ability to have uh, longevity for seven years. But we ensure that we uh, install sufficient tracer in the well to guarantee detection for the, the quoted lifespan that we have. Thank you, Colin. Tracer. Yeah, we hope it does. And we see more questions are coming in. So there is another question which is quite detailed. So I'll try to read it through. For the tracers wrapped around the liner and perforated, how do you prevent the tracer rods? from being damaged during perforation? Somebody asks. Okay, so okay. for the liner application, the uh, you will damage the tracer where the, 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 uh, the perforated charge is, is located. But the um, we ensure that for that particular zone, there is additional material present in the screen so that uh, even after destroying some of the tracer material uh, due to the explosive charge, uh, there is still sufficient material there to be wetted and then to be taken to surface by the uh, activation fluid, whether it's oil or water. So yes, traces are, are damaged when the, for the, by the perforating charges, but we have sufficient material there to compensate for that. Right, good, thank you, Colin. So then there is another question, it's, which says, how long does your inflow traces last for? Not sure if I missed it or not, somebody says. Ed, would you like to answer? Yeah, um, sure. So I, I think uh, it was a similar question asked earlier, yes. but but um, to, to add to what Colin said, it, it is 
dependent on your uh, reservoir conditions such as uh, reservoir temperature, reservoir pressure. It also is dependent on um, the completion fluids that may be used. So if you're going to um, pump uh, or stimulate the well with hydrochloric acid at 28%, for example, uh, that will have an impact on, on longevity as well. But in principle, um, under ideal uh, conditions, uh, up to 10 years of, of oil detection is possible and up to seven years for, for water uh, longevity. And this is seven years upon water breakthrough time. So if you have a dry well that's producing for, let's say, five years and the water breakthrough doesn't occur until the fifth year, then you still have seven years of longevity of water. Okay. Um, so, so an ideal condition to perhaps last longer is that we we in a in a certain temperature range, a low flow rate well is most likely going to be on shore, uh, where we be able to you know provide longer longevity than if you're in a say a, a subsea environment where you got all the flow commingled at very very high total liquid rate, so then the, the longevity won't be won't be as long. But it, it is it it is it is calculated on a on a well and reservoir basis. So every reservoir well is going to be different longevity. Thank you, Ed. In addition to the similar question, uh, another person is asking. So the person is asking, what is the lifespan of your traces? But in addition to that, uh, they ask for any North Sea examples, whether we have or not. And I guess this is something that we can say we will be we can go in depth in the uh, in the next webinar because we sure have uh, for sure have an examples. Uh, but uh, just now we don't have uh, enough time to to go in depth into that. There is another question which says why are so many rods required for some applications? Colin. Can you answer this question? So the um, uh, as uh, Ed mentioned before as well, the um, if you have a single well, a dry a dry tree single well, uh, you're only concerned with the flow from that particular well. So uh, once traces are activated and flow to surface, any dilution in the uh, of the fluid in that particular sample at surface is just concerned with the production well or the production from that individual well. Um, the increase in tracer rod quantities is required when you are commingling two or three wells or six wells or ten wells into the one line um, and then you, so you're sampling for example in a platform or uh, an FPSO or a central processing facility where you have a, a number of wells that are commingled there we have to take into consideration the dilution effect uh, of all other wells as well uh, in order for us to detect um traces from that individual well so the sampling location is critical and knowing the rate of flow at that particular uh, sampling location will determine how many rods are required uh, inside that a particular well uh, they may have um, say production of 10,000 barrels a day but commingled you may have 70 or 80,000 barrels a day all right, Colin, thank you. Now the question is interesting, just because we have not uh, discussed about this topic during this webinar. So it says, do you have gas traces or if not, when will you have them? Could we guys answer this question? Sure, I can uh, I can answer that one. Um, yeah. I, I assume the, the person is referring to gas traces at inflow. Um, mm -hmm. And the answer is yes. Um, they have been uh, uh, piloted with several operators uh, around the world, and basically they've been successfully uh, detected uh, and interpreted. So yeah, so the quick answer is, is yes, they are um, available for inflow. Uh, for the interwell, yeah. they've been around for a long time and, uh, and they're regularly used. Um, and just there's a little bit more detail, the gas traces that we uh, we use for interwell are the, are the same ones that we have embedded in our polymer rods and and um, that's the only difference really we've basically put the commercially used 
uh, gas traces for, from Interwell and embed them now into the polymers. And um, yeah, we, we can now explicitly monitor gas inflow. Right. And it's, I think it's worthwhile mentioning that we will have a separate webinar dedicated to the gas traces. So uh, those of you who were interested in learning more about gas traces and might have any additional questions, please uh, uh, keep, in, keep that in mind and find us on LinkedIn and follow our page to get notified when this gas tracer webinar will be scheduled. Another clarification question, I guess, is says so the permanent traces would be installed during well planning or completion the person is asking could you guys answer this one yep so the um i'll tell you that the uh for example for sunscreens um they weld the screen at the end uh onto the base pipe so our traces have to be installed prior to the welding of those sunscreens for the in the, the manufacturing process. So for example, um, uh, tracers, uh, screens might be ordered uh, six months in a year in advance, but our tracers have to be installed at the end of that process. For the liner and casing application, um, the time frame is much smaller. So we're able to install the tracers on the outside of the casing. Um, seal them inside that uh, in a sleeve, and then immediately they can go in the back of a truck and on a boat and off to the rig. So ideally, tracers should be at the start of every planning process for a well, because uh, then you can optimize um, the completion, the screen design, to ensure that you the objectives that are for monitoring, we can actually uh, achieve those goals with you. Thank you, Colin. Another question is about the delivery time. Which, so the person asks, why does it take so long to deliver interpretation or answers? Colin, would you like to take this one? Um, yep, yeah, it's a wide ranging question. Very often um, the analysis of tracers uh, for the interpretation itself um, it's a conversation very often with the uh, the operator as well. So if we have insufficient information uh, regarding the well, then it'll take longer for us to, to identify uh, reasons for a particular um, analysis. Um, but ideally, we want to analyze the tracing material as soon as the, it rec it's received in the, uh, the lab in Trondheim. And then the analysis generally would take uh, uh, perhaps a few days, four days, perhaps, to go through um, the production data, the, the actual uh, trace analysis, verify some results, and then present the information to to the operator, uh, to the reservoir engineer. Um, I think it's a case by case basis. Uh, it depends when you start the clock. Um, but obviously, the shipping of material, uh, tracer samples from um, the location to the lab. Uh, if that is the delay area, then um, that's something that we can address. But again, very often that will require some uh, cooperation from the operator as well. All right. Thank you, Colin. The time is running and now we need to make some important announcements. The, the, there are a few more questions, actually a lot more questions uh, in the questions area. Thanks for those. We see owners of the questions so we make sure that we come back to those offline so this is the first webinar out of series to come and we have prepared interesting and challenging topics to discuss with you so please find the restman page on linkedin and follow it just to make sure that you get notified about the coming webinars and please let us know if there is any specific question you would like our technology experts to address in the next session just bring them in the comments field to the LinkedIn post about the webinar or simply write us an email to communications at resman.no. Thank you for participating in today's webinar. We hope to see you again next time. Thanks a lot. Goodbye.